My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Thank you, Tiffany. I couldn't help but to think as you were singing that song about the man we're going to study about today. Turn to Luke chapter 5. His name was Simon Peter. Originally, his name was Simon or Simeon. And then later, Jesus changed his name or added to his name Peter, which means Petros, which means rock. I couldn't help but I guess I was thinking about him as you were singing that song today. And what a blessing that song would have been to him as well. Kind of puts into his words, I think, what was in his heart. Luke chapter 5. The Bible says it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, that is Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, or Capernaum, Galilee, verse 2, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and washing their nets. It was apparently that morning, an early morning. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and Jesus sat down, and then he taught the people out of the ship. You know, as I think about this right here, that how they probably won, you know, the Bible says that people were pressing upon Jesus, and we know that oftentimes Jesus drew huge, tremendous, huge crowds, uh, not only hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And so I think that probably for one reason, he got into the ship to give himself a little bit of space the Bible says the, pre, the people were just, I guess, wanting to touch him even. You know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They were just doing like that probably many times because they knew of all the miracles that he had performed. He had, you know, feed the hungry and heal the sick and even on a few occasions raise the dead. And so the people, the Bible says they're pressing in on him. And so maybe he got into the boat there to try to give himself a little bit of space but then I think also, too, probably getting out on the water and speaking from the boat, what did that do? It kind of amplified his voice, didn't it? You know, if you, somebody can be out on a boat out on the lake and they don't think that anybody is, can hear them. No, 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 you can hear them, can't you, on the shore. You can hear them because that, that water is carrying the voice. And so probably I think maybe that's one of the reasons as well is that Jesus was, he was amplifying his voice so that he could preach to the people. Oftentimes, as I said, people would draw near to Jesus for the miracles, but it, it's, in, it's interesting that it says on this day in verse 1, it says that they pressed upon him to hear the word of God. They were wanting to hear what it was that he had to say. And the Bible says that Jesus spoke as one who had authority and not just as the other religious leaders. So Jesus didn't just preach a message as men do today. Sometimes I, I study hard. I pray over a message. I try to preach the best I can when I preach a message, but I, I can't preach with the authority that Jesus can because he's the living word of God. And so I, I, I'm sure that when Jesus spoke, it must have melted people. The words for Jesus, I could read his words and it would not have the impact. I don't think that what it would when Jesus himself would be speaking. And the Bible says the people wanted to hear the word of God. And I could imagine, I would imagine that many of the people that were there that day, it was not the, we know it was not the religious leaders, but it was poor people, and probably it was sinful people, very sinful people. Because it says later in the Luke chapter 15 that one day it says, then drew near the publicans and sinners to hear him. The publicans were the tax collectors, as you know. And so they were probably some of the most, they were party kind of people. They had a, a lot of money. They had very little morals. They were just in life for what they could get out of life. And that as well as the sinners, which refer to drunkards and harlots and just the, the wild kind of people of life. The Bible says that on one occasion, the publicans and sinners drew near to hear Jesus. Why? Why did they want, why would sinful people want to hear Jesus? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I think, because I believe that they sensed, not only did Jesus speak with authority, but I believe they sensed that Jesus loved them, even as Tiffany was singing about there a moment ago. I believe that they probably sensed a love from a genuineness 
and a connection with their heart as Jesus would speak to them. And I think there's another reason as well why this kind of people drew near to Jesus to hear him because there was, listen, there was a hunger in their heart to hear truth. You know, sometimes, sometimes we kind of categorize people the word prejudice means to prejudge, right? And we can be prejudiced not only towards somebody's color of their skin, but we're prejudiced all the time. And we can see people and we prejudge, you know, we see the clothes they're wearing or what, how they've marked their body or the, the piercings or the hairstyle or whatever. It's different from us. And so sometimes we see people and we prejudge them because we think, you know, we already know who they are. And, and maybe they've gone through a phase in their life, as many of us have. Maybe they've gone through a phase in their life where they have made some very foolish decisions. But maybe now they're at a point in life to where they're actually stepping back and thinking, what is life really about? And life does that to us, don't, doesn't it? You know, sometimes as we get older, we kind of start mellowing out and maturing, and we start thinking about life in a little bit of a deeper way. That's why whenever I do a funeral, I always try to present the gospel at a funeral because it's something about death that makes us think about life. You know, we kind of come to a funeral and we just kind of pause there and we think a little bit in a little bit of a deeper way. And so I believe that publicans and sinners and that kind of people often drew near to Jesus, one, because they felt like Jesus loved them, whereas the rest of society, especially the Jews, the Pharisees, and you know, all of that group. I mean, they just, they shunned them. Yet Jesus, he didn't love their lifestyle, but he loved them. And so love draws people, right? And so the love of Christ drew them, but then also Jesus said things to them that, that was feeding something inside of their soul that they wanted to hear. Augustine, many, many years ago, there was a man by the name of Augustine. And Augustine, he had a very godly mother, but Augustine, Augustine would fit well into society today. Augustine could go on most major college campus today and be the student body president. Forgive me for being so bold, but that's because he was a, he was a party kind of guy. He was, he was, you know, he loved to party. He, he, Augustine as well had an immoral lifestyle, and this is back hundreds of years ago. And Augustine had a mother, though, who was a godly woman, and she prayed for her son that one day he would find salvation. And God did save Augustine. Augustine did hear God speaking to him one day. And he knew the truth already from the way he had been raised in life. And so Augustine then responded to that. And Augustine accepted Christ as his Savior. But Augustine, let me read to you one sentence out of a prayer that Augustine wrote. and How powerful this sentence is. He said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Some people have said that there's a, there's a, there's a God-shaped hole in everyone's heart that only God himself can fill. And I believe that. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because the Bible says that God made us, and he made us in his own image. God made us, and he made us in his own image, and the Bible said God made us for his own purpose and pleasure. So therefore, I believe that, that we, even I think there's Christians. I think that there are even Christians who've accepted Christ as their Savior, yet still are not finding the joy and the satisfaction in life is because they still have not come to the place to where they are in sync with who God wants them to be. And, and I believe that that's really the only way that we will try to find truths joy and satisfaction in heaven. I, uh, I made a profession of faith, accepted Christ when I was 12 years old, and then I went through my teen years, just like a lot of teen year, teenagers do in my early adulthood. I was just like most, you know, that's who I, I was. Yet it, this, this is really going to sound very, very crazy. Some of you will understand what I'm saying, some of you won't. But I'll tell you, it's amazing. Sometimes I was out partying and having conversation about God. Isn't that crazy? You know, you think, well, if you're partying, that's the last thing you talk about. Yet, even I'd be in the midst of that, yet I knew, and it's amazing sometimes the conversations that would come up with a bunch of us would be out hanging around talking about something. And I knew every time, I knew the truth in my heart. And when I was about uh, 
21. When I was about 21, I wanted to be free, and I wanted to do my own thing, and I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Florida, and so I thought, I'm going to move to Florida and, and live with them, and I won't go through all the story there, but I, I tried that for a while, and then it's amazing. God was speaking to me in the midst, and running from God, God was speaking to me, and I left I left, I drove straight through from Palm Beach, Florida back home one, di- one night. At that time, it took 18 hours. And I got in a car by myself, and I started driving back, and I left Palm Beach, Florida in rebellion against God, and I arrived in Snowville, Virginia, in sync with God. And you say, well, what, who spoke to you? God spoke to me. You know, Jonah, you can get on the boat, but God's going to get on the boat with you, right? And so God was speaking to me and God was was calling me and so that's why the crowd was there that day they wanted there was a hunger in them they wanted to hear something from this man that loved them now verse 4 now when Jesus had left speaking or ended his teaching that he had that day he said unto Simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught or for a great catch of fish now you know, you've heard this before, preached before, and you understand this, that the one, they're fishing with nets. They're not fishing with rods and reels, and so they can't just let the bait down deeper into the water. They can fish no deeper than they can reach with their nets. And in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, if you know anything at all about fishing, you know that fish are not going to be at the top of the water in the bright sun in the heat of the day. And so the fish are much deeper at this point. They're in the cool part of the water. They're much deeper than they could fish for that day. And yet Jesus, who really had been raised by a carpenter and knew nothing as far as they thought, I mean, what do you know about fishing? My great-granddad was a fisherman is probably what some of these men could have said. What do you know about fishing? Yet they had been interacting. This was the not, not the first encounter that Simon Peter had had with Jesus. And so God was working in Simon's heart. He was stirring. God was creating this hunger in Simon's heart. And, and Simon, verse 5, Simon answering, said unto him, Master, listen, we have labored all night, and we didn't catch a single fish. Not a fish. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net break. Verse 7, and they beckoned unto the partners, which were, this was James and John, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that so much that the ships began to sink. You know what I was thinking as I was studying this this week? The same God that was in control of causing the nets to be full was the same God that had been in control of causing the nets to be empty. And sometimes God gives us an empty net in life to get our attention. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes God has got to make our net be empty so that we're ready to listen and get the full net. And so I think that Christ had kept a single fish, probably fish that night, had been swimming near the net and, whoop, you know, the other direction. He kept a single fish. I don't mean a few fish. They said not a single fish. All night long, throw the nets out. Put them back in. Nothing but seaweed. All right. Listen, we fished all night long and not caught a single fish. But because I have respect for you, I'll do what you told me to do. And the, listen, they didn't just catch one net full of fish. The Bible says they caught so many fish that it was about to sink two boats. That's a lot of fish. They were coming back into shore with about that much of the side of the boat sticking out of the water. That's crazy, isn't it, to think about that, what God is doing. And then when they reach the shore, verse 8, and when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Why did, why did he say that at that point? Well, what had been going on? You know, Simon Peter and his and friend, Andrew, his brother, and then James and John, they'd fished all night, but they caught no fishes, you know. They'd done all of that, and then they're washing their nets out that next morning. Then Jesus comes along, whom they've already met before. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. So 
Andrew had already when found, found Peter, Simon Peter, and said, listen, we have found the Messiah. So, and Jesus had already been in Simon Peter's home at this point. So Simon Peter is what sometimes people call a seeker. He's kind of seeking. He's kind of being drawn in, but yet they, he's kind of going back and forth. He doesn't know which way to go. And it's hard to let go of self sometimes, isn't it? And he's having a hard time of letting go of, of self. He's in this quandary going back and forth in this. And then when, when he catches this, why, why? And you know what I just I noticed? It doesn't say that he fell on his knees. Jesus is sitting there in the boat, and the Bible says that Simon falls at the knees of Jesus. Which is, I don't know why, but it just kind of strikes me to think that he's right, to, right on his face, his knees, right at the knees of Jesus. And that's a good place to be, isn't it? And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Why did he say that? Well, Simon had launched his boat out into the water, and as Jesus, I don't know how long his message was, maybe it was 10 minutes, probably Jesus could preach a 10-minute message, and it'd be better than all that I'll have put together. But I don't know how long, but while Jesus is preaching the message, what is going on on the boat? What's going on with Simon? He has to listen, even though he's washing his nets probably and sewing and mending. You know, as one guy put it, he's a captive audience. He has nowhere to go but to listen to Jesus. You know, and I've wondered what Jesus taught that day. And the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus' message was that day. We know that Jesus often spoke in parables. And so I have no doubt that Jesus told a parable that day, and that parable penetrated into Simon's heart. You know, Luke records a parable that Jesus told one day, and I don't know that it was this parable, but let's say that it was this parable. It was a parable about a man who had two sons. And the youngest son said, Dad, I want to go out and explore the world. I want my part of the inheritance. And so the father was willing to give the son his part of the inheritance, and Jesus told that story that day. He said that son went out into the world, and soon he just, he just he had money. He was just throwing money in every direction. He had friends, and he was just partying, and he had a great life until then what? He turned around one day and what? He had no money. He was broke. He was completely broke. And then he went and he tried to beg people to find food, and nobody would feed him. Finally, a man who had a hog farm was willing to hire the, the boy, and the boy was out one day feeding the hogs, and what? What did Jesus tell in that story? The boy looked at the hog food, the slop, and thought, you know, <laughs> that would be a pretty good meal. Well, that's pretty low, isn't it? That is pretty low when you think hog slop would be a good meal. But Jesus, when Jesus was telling that story about that boy that day, it really wasn't about physically, it wasn't about somebody physically eating hog slop. What was it about? It was about people spiritually eating hog slop. You see, the Bible says that God has created all of us in His own image. We're not animals. We're people that have been created, human beings, created in the image of God. And we're like, we were the, we were the son. We were Adam and Eve. They were in the Father's house. That's what that story is about. They were in the Father's house until Satan deceived them and said, listen, you can have something better outside of the Father's house than you can have in the Father's house. You need to come out and enjoy the world. And so Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and step out of their Father's house into the world. And from that point on, what has mankind suffered? Heartache and sorrow. From that point on, the world is eating slop. People are prostituting their bodies. People are doing people are doing everything. And I don't mean that just a harlot. I mean just people. People on Wall Street are prostituting their life for another dollar. Selling their soul just for another dollar. And so the world is full of people like the prodigal son. The world is, I don't know, they might have on a $500 suit today. But they're the son who could have been in the father's house eating from the table of God Almighty, and yet they're just out here just eating drugs and alcohol and sex and greed and broken homes. And, man, it just goes on and on and on and on, doesn't it? It's going on in the world today. And so this son is eating this, and, 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 and I'm sure that Jesus could tell a story to where you are right there in it. And so when Jesus got to that point in the story where the son is ready to eat the slop, what did, what did the people on the shore, and what did Simon Peter think? That's me. 
That's me. That's what I'm doing. I'm just eating the slop of this world. Because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly who Simon Peter was before this, but here's, here's my scenario. He was a man who made his living by being up all night long, hanging out with a bunch of rough guys, and then sleeping all day so he could get up the next evening and go back to work. And so what do you think went on on those boats during the middle of the night? You know, the cursing, the dirty jokes. You say they had dirty jokes. They've had dirty jokes since the beginning of time, right? Immorality, the things that those, probably those men talked about. And then probably some days when they came in and they had a great catch of fish, what did somebody probably say? Hey, let's go get a bottle of wine before we go home. And so probably some home, some I don't know this, I don't put them down too bad, but I'm just being human, right? Probably there were some days when Simon Peter and his brother, his Andrew, and they got home that day, probably they staggered home that day. Here's the rest of the money, I'm going to bed. He was a dirty man. He was a spiritually dirty man. Now I want to tell you something. Jesus said that you and I have to come to the point of seeing ourselves as spiritually dirty people before he can clean us up. Jesus said, I can't give sight to somebody that thinks they can already see. He said, I can't heal somebody that thinks they're already well. I remember one time I was sharing, this happened, I can tell you, I don't know how many times I've talked with a man, and it's invariable, you know, I've talked with this man about his salvation and trying to share his salvation with him, and as I start talking with this man about, you know, the first verse of Scripture that I always go to when I share the gospel is Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that day as I was witnessing to that man, he had the television on, and I looked at the television, and I said, All of those people that you see on that screen right now are sinful people. All the people that are around in this building here, they're all sinful people. They've sinned. I've sinned. You've sinned. And you know what? Most of the time when I say that, people say to me, this man said, well, probably the most I've ever stolen is a pencil. Which, what's he trying to say? I may not be perfect, but I'm not that bad. And then people try to tell me about their religious spirit as they were grow experiences they were growing up. I went to church this many times, and I did this, and I did that. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to justify themselves. I want to tell you something. You can't find the kingdom of heaven when you're trying to justify yourself. When the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it means all. When the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, it means there is none, including the Pope. Right? There is none. There's only been one sinless person on this earth, the Son of God, who became a man so that he could offer the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And all the rest are sinful people. And I think the reason, you know, the crowd there that day that was listening to Jesus, I guarantee you there wasn't any Pharisees there. If they were, they were skeptics. The religious people who, the, the, the lawyers, the Levites, the scribes, all of those people, they were not there that day. Why? Because they don't need a Savior. As far as they're concerned, they don't need a Savior. But you know what's an amazing thing? The drunkards, the prostitutes, and those people that day who had broken lives needed a Savior. That's why missionaries can go into third world countries and people will grab the Bibles out of their hands. And in America, we're trying to figure out how to get them out of the motel room, right? Because they have nothing. But we've got so much as a nation, we don't think we need God. And it won't be salvation for America until God breaks America. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but that's my prophecy. What's well, going to have to happen? We've got to be at the bottom sometimes before we can look up and see what God has for us. And so Simon Peter, as Jesus is telling us about the prodigal son that day, and Simon Peter's thinking, I'm that dirty, filthy boy. That's who I am, man, my life. What am I doing in my life? I'm not as young as I used to be. You know, and I just out in this old hot sun all day, just baking my skin and just 
what am I doing with my life? And then Jesus continued to tell that story. And what did Jesus say? The boy said, you know, I'm going to go home, at least beg my father to be one of his servants. And the boy returned back home in that story. And when he got near home, what did the father do? The father ran out to the son and grabbed the son and embraced the son and put his own robe on the son and put a ring on his feet and shoes on his feet and threw a feast and said, this my son was dead and is alive. And I'm sure as Jesus, whenever he told that parable or whatever parable he told this day, there were some people probably thinking, could I be alive? Is there some hope for me? This brought a great conviction in Simon Peter's heart. And so he said to the Lord that day, he said, Lord, Master, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. What's he saying? He's not saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you. He's saying, I am not worthy to have anything to do with you. I don't believe that somebody has to cry in order to be saved. But I believe oftentimes it does happen. Because I believe that sometimes when people get a real good glimpse of who they are, it shames them and it breaks their heart. You know, the night that I went forward to, to go into the ministry, they've been, I've been battling with this for, for 10 or 12 years. And even the night that I finally, as a Christian, yielded my life to go into the ministry, and that night I went forward, and I was 29 years old, and when I left the pew, I sat back like in there somewhere, and I came forward. And when I got to the altar that night, you know what I did? <laughs> you, know, you know why I was doing that? A million pounds had been taken off of me. There was so much relief, release from that burden that I'd been carrying, trying to rebel against God. There was so much of a relief from that and a release from that that I wasn't crying out of sorrow. I was crying out of joy. I was just broken before God. I want to tell you something. It is good to be broken before God. The Bible says that one day there was a woman who had an issue of blood. She had a bleeding problem that no doctor could cure. And this woman didn't come up to Jesus and look him square in the face and say, wait a minute, let me have a few minutes of your time. Let me, no, what did, what did she do? She followed up behind him. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she touched the hem of his garment, and the Bible says Jesus felt virtue go out of him. He didn't even say a word to her at that point. Isn't that amazing? The power of a broken heart before God a broken heart is an honest heart, a real heart, a sincere heart. Jesus said, I felt virtue go out of me. A woman came to Jesus one day who had a demon-possessed daughter. She was a Canaanite woman. You know anything about the Old Testament? The Canaanites were the enemies of Jews. A Canaanite woman came to Jesus one day and said, would you, come, would you cast a demon out of my daughter? Can you imagine having that? daughter with a demon in her would you cast the demon out of my daughter and Jesus he was trying to see how deep her faith was and he was teaching the lesson that day what did Jesus say it is not right to take the bread of the children and give it to the dogs what did she say yeah but the puppies can eat the crumbs that fall off the table all I want is the crumbs you know what the Bible says? Jesus said, great is thy faith. Be it done unto you as you have asked. Jesus was crucified on the cross. There was a thief on each side of him. One of the thieves mocked Jesus. One of the thieves said, if you be the Son of God, why don't you get us out of this mess? The other guy said, what? Don't you fear God knowing you're about to die? We deserve to be executed. But this man has done nothing. Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I was talking with a man one day, trying to witness to him. This man kept on trying to talk with me about various denominations. I said, you want to know something? 
There wasn't a denomination that day. There's only two kinds of people in this world, those who know Christ and those who don't. And that man in that state, only a breath away from dying, said, Lord, what, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? What's he saying? Would you please be gracious unto me? And what did Jesus say? Go and clean up your life and get baptized and join the church? And No, what did Jesus say? Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That man was saved that day. There are no magical words. The words have to come out of the heart, though. They have to be real. They have to be genuine. They have to be sincere. We have to realize that we're sick. And then the healer wants to heal us. Simon Peter said, Master, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I'm not even worthy to be here with you. Verse 9, and for he was astonished and all that were with him at the draw of the fishes that which they had taken. Watch, they realized that this was a miracle. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and which were partners with Simon. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said unto Simon, Fear not. It's the same thing as today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. What's that mean? I'm going to turn your life completely upside down and inside out. You've been going in one direction. And I'm about to totally change your entire life. And you're going to start going in another direction. You've been going away from God. I'm about to help you walk towards God. Fear not, he said. From henceforth thou shalt yourself catch men. Verse 11 says, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I believe it was the day of their salvation. If it wasn't salvation, it was the day of the surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Let me ask you a question. What about you? You know, the Bible says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. I believe that it is the will of God to save every person on the face of this earth. The Bible says that God so loved the world, which includes me and it includes you. Whenever I present the gospel to someone, most of the time, I will eventually, the last verse of Scripture I take them to is John 3.16. The reason I take them to John 3.16 because that's the verse somebody took me to when I was saved. And I do just what that man did to me many, many years ago. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That man said, you know, you could put your place, your name in that place right there. For God so loved Terry. Whenever I talk with somebody, I'll say their name. For God so loved, and I'll say their name. That God gave his only begotten son. That if whosoever, that if Terry, that if that name believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn Terry, to condemn that name, but that if Terry, that if that individual, that if you would believe in Him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. To save you. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know of a time you may not know the exact day, but you'll know that it happened. You'll know that God did something miraculous in your heart during that time period. You say, well, I'm a member of a church. That's not salvation. Being a member of a church, being baptized is not salvation. Being salvation is coming to that point to where you understand that you are sinful before God, that God sent His Son to die for your sins, 
and you come to a point just like Simon Peter that you fall at the knees of Jesus and you fall at the knees of Jesus and you say, God, forgive me. You know, Jesus told a story one day. I'll close with this. He told a story one day about two men who went to the temple on the same day. One was a Pharisee, which was a very religious man, and the other was a publican, which was a tax collector, a very simple man. The religious man went to the temple that day, and what did he pray? Oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like such and such. Look how good I am. And the publican, what did he pray? The Bible said he would not even look up towards heaven. He just said, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let's suppose you'd never heard that before. Let's suppose that's the first time you'd ever heard that, and you had to make a decision between who would go to heaven, a very religious man or a very sinful man. Who would you say would be going to heaven? The religious man. Whom did Jesus say went to heaven? The sinful man. Why? Because God loves sin? No. Because the sinful man humbled himself before God. The re religious man wouldn't humble himself before God, and so therefore he never he was not saved. There will be religious people in hell. You understand that? There will be religious people in hell because they have never been saved. It's the individual like that man that says, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know something? You can't be too low for God to save you. You can't be too low. You may think, well, I'm too low. No, you cannot be too low for God to save you if you'll but turn to Him.